Thank and uh, I can tell you now that uh, the uh, winner of the Economics Nobel Prize uh, 2019, he is one of three in total, is joining us now, Professor Dr. Abhijit Banerjee. And we are, of course, absolutely delighted that he's joining us live for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Ms. Eko Swehi E.I. Hen. She's secretary of the Insurance Development Forum. And you can join the discussion by submitting your questions in the chat. Eko Swehi and Dr. Banerjee, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so perhaps to start off, I will just say good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening to all of you who have taken the time to join us uh, from various parts of the world for the annual forum and for particularly this um, session. My name is Ekoswehi Iyahen, as was mentioned. I'm the Secretary General of the Insurance uh, Development Forum. It's a real honor and delight to be able to lead this conversation today on the theme Building a More Resilient Society, Systems and Finance Matter, with our esteemed guest, Professor Abhijit Banerjee, and as was indicated, the 2019 Nobel Laureate for Economics. So welcome, Professor Banerjee. We had a bit of technical issues, but we worked yes. through it and we are here. <laughs> yeah, it was stressful for a moment, I must say. Great. Yes. So um, so perhaps to set a bit of context for, for the conversation, for those of us who are, uh, are, are dialing in, I think that all of us have witnessed uh, over the past year two now the impact of COVID-19 on the world, the transformation in terms of our lives, uh, and also particularly the impact on poor and vulnerable um, communities amongst us. We're also heading into COP26 in Glasgow, where there are grave concerns in terms of our ability to match the expectations as relates both to mitigation um, and importantly also on adaptation. So over the next 25 minutes, hopefully, <laughs> Professor, uh, we can begin to uh, unpack the theme in the context of these developments with a focus on three core areas, which is how can we strengthen the underlying economic and crisis risk finance system, given what we have witnessed with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, climate change, and what we are seeing around the world? How does this converge with the incredible body of work that exists around poverty reduction and poverty alleviation? And what are some of the lessons that we can learn from that to inform the work that we have also been pursuing through the Insure Resilience Global Partnership? And then finally, I would like maybe have perhaps on a light, lighter note, but quite a serious note still, is how do we deepen the collaboration with the economist, community of economists around there? Uh, and I think that this is one, Professor, that goes uh, directly to some of your, ref your reflections in your last book. So that's really the approach to the conversation over the next uh, few minutes. I know that quite a few of you have submitted questions. Uh, that we can pose. Um, and I've tried to build this into the conversation. But of course, uh, as our discussion evolves, you're welcome to put those questions into the chat box um, and we can raise them depending on time. So getting right into it, uh, Professor, again, welcome. Uh, as I mentioned, the world is still in the midst of a pandemic uh, with climate change on our hands. And in the recent past, and particularly I will reference an FT article, you, you mentioned the critical weaknesses that exist in the plumbing of economic systems. Can you expand a little bit on that concept and that thinking which you, you had also shared there? So I, I think that one of the uh, ways in which we often get things wrong is that we think of, think of policy making from, you know, from a, an airplane. And the problem from looking at an airplane is that we, everything looks kind of you know, there are hills, there are valleys, but we don't see that in the middle of the hill there's a big rock. And if we actually try to land, it's, we're going to hit the, the big rock. And I, I think that's a bit the way, I, what we mean by plumbing is paying attention to those rocks, to, 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 to looking at the problem from a height where you can see all the details uh, that need to get right. And I think where, where a lot of these conversations founder is exactly on that question. I mean, we don't know often enough about the details and we don't know how to design around them. And it's not, and there I think our sort of the broad principles are not very helpful. I mean, we know we know that insurance is needed. We know that you know at multiple levels is needed. But exactly how to get it to the right people, how to design it, how how to convince people that it is uh, doing what they want and that they should be assured by it, those are all questions that need to be answered if we have to have an effective uh, insurance system going. Yeah. 
thanks, thanks so much for that reflection. I, I also found particularly insightful uh, the case studies that you shared in terms of the experience. If we, we reference the experience with COVID-19 in India um, and Togo, where we talked about systems and finance, right? The importance of both when we think about managing crisis. And obviously this converges with uh, insurance thinking and the value of insurance and the, uh, where is it appropriate? So I think sharing a bit about that could actually be quite um, helpful. Right. So I, I think that the, the, those are both interesting examples and they point to exactly, as you say, uh, to the, the, the two constraints we face. So in India, uh, the problem was, the money wasn't so much the problem. There was at least a willingness at a very, not a particularly generous level, but at a level at which it would still have helped a lot of people uh, to spend money. The problem was that the the plumbing, the, the pipes the, to send the money to people were not set up. And the reason why it was not set up is interesting. It's sort of India thinks of itself as being a country where, you know, people live in their own villages and they earn their living in their own villages. It's sort of, that's a, it's a, it's a conception of the country, which in a sense is still, I think, Gandhian. And problem is that people don't live that way. M many, 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 many people, and we actually, interestingly, part of the result of not, uh, not engaging with this fact is that we don't even know how many people. It could be as much as you know, 70 or 80 million people. That's the size of, uh, you know, bigger than France or Germany. Or it could be maybe only 40 million people, but we're talking about lots and lots and lots of people who live somewhere else temporarily than where their official home is. Their official home might be in a village in east of India and West Bengal. They might be working in a construction site in Surat in the west of India, uh, um, you know, more than a thousand miles away. And, and there's the welfare system is not designed to take that into account, or was not designed to take that into account. They're trying to move to that, but it, uh, it's going to take some time. So you, you can, you're can you entitled to social support. You can get essentially free food uh, where you live, um, if you are, unless you are in, rich enough to avoid it, but 75% of the population are eligible for some form of quite generous uh, food, food security support but you can only get it in your own village. So if you happen to be a thousand miles away, it, there is no, uh, you know, your entitlement arrives, if it does, in your own village. It doesn't arrive where you are. And so t we haven't, and the fact that this time people might go in a different direction and then the last time, so they may not even go to the same place, that makes it even more complicated. You need a system which allows people to take their social support with them. And the conception, the, the theory that people essentially live in their villages, which is no longer true, has guided that, uh, that structure. So that's an example of where the concept was wrong, the plumbing was wrong. In Togo, it's the opposite. Togo had great plumbing. I mean, interestingly, for a poor uh, African country, it, it had set up, so the, the government had managed to connect a lot, already had managed to connect a lot of people's uh, cell phones to uh, a bank account and an account in, in the government so that money could be transferred to them. And when, the, uh, when, the, when COVID happened, it quickly expanded that system. So the system was ready, but the cash wasn't there. The country as a whole didn't have the money to keep funding that for long enough. So there was a, a sort of burst of funding and then money ran out. And when money ran out, money ran out. And so, and those are the sort of the twin peaks, uh, twin pillars of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of any uh, kind of social insurance system, uh, plumbing and funding. And uh, you have to get them both together in the right place or you, it doesn't work. Yes, great insights, uh, Professor. And again, to your point about, you know, the airplane view versus being aware of the rocks, right? So context matters, understanding the local context, being proactive about really defining how do you get to people and also finance. Um, but obviously, this, this idea of systems and finance is very much linked to the work of the Insure Resilience Global Partnership, which is really focused on the idea of prearranged financing. And what we've seen with 
COVID-19 with climate uh, disasters, I should say, is that generally there is very little funding uh, support for countries before these events actually occur. So if we think about COVID, only 2 to 3 percent of global disaster finance was prearranged. Um, and that's quite significant. And that's a study that was done by the Center for Disaster Protection. And the, the approach to it was basically a begging bowl principle, right? So what do you think is required, given what you've just reflected on, on the importance of systems, the importance of financing? What do you think is required for the international community, national governments, to shift this from this post-financing uh, to prearranged uh, rule-based crisis financing? Well, I think part of the uh, what needs to be understood is that, of course, prearranged doesn't necessarily mean uh, free. It means somebody's paying for it. And the question is, who's going to pay for it? And part of this, uh, the negotiations that are happening right now around climate change is, is absolutely about that question, which is who, who, who should pay for it? For the poorest countries in the world, do they need to carry the full charge of it? Will the price of it be somehow subsidized by, uh, by somebody? So part of the reason why we don't see it is because there is no clarity and there's a fear that if we actually go ahead and pay for it, then people will say, well, you can afford to pay for it, you're done. So we're really in this strange war of attrition uh, where we are all kind of waiting for clarity on this. And I think the quicker we move to some clarity, which is that this is how much subsidy will be provided and this is who will provide the subsidy, I think the more clearly the markets can work. The markets are right now, everybody's waiting on the resolution of that uncertainty. And that, that, that's a critical uh, problem we face. And it, it's one that, in my view, should be resolved by a, a, a very generous move by the richer countries. But, but it's also the case that whatever that level of generosity be, till that is revealed, we're going to start, we will see this little bit of you know, foot dragging because it, 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 I think people don't want to make commitments till it's clear who's paying for it. And that's, that's true on all sides. It's also true that the institutional structure of you know, regulating that is not fully clear. You know, what is a disaster? Uh, this is this is a uh, this needs to be very clear, and there needs to be measurement that's very credible. Because I, what you don't want is in the middle of a disaster, um, Togo arguing with uh, the insurer whether this is a disaster or not. And I think the credibility of that will also improve if some of the biggest countries in the world come in and say that we are paying for it. We are going to, if you try to, you know, weasel out of it, we will, we will come after you or whatever. We will, we will, we can take legal action, which will be credible. I, I think it's, that's a, that measurement piece of it is critical because otherwise, of course, this is an op open-ended commitment on both sides and then who God knows what happens during the disaster. So nobody wants that kind of commitment. Um, and I think that getting uh, as many powerful players involved in the institutional structure of deciding, uh, you know, what is a disaster, what is a local disaster, what is a, you know, because of microclimates and increasing variation will need to be more mindful of that. It cannot just be that, you know, all of India doesn't need to be in a disaster. It can be, you know, uh, uh, you know, 50,000 square miles, but 50,000 square miles of a disaster is still uh, needs to be dealt with. So I think all of those issues are sort of being, partly being parked, partly, uh, I mean, there is, people sort of understand them, but I don't think there is enough uh, kind of institutional clarity on them. Yes, fantastic, uh, Professor. And it really takes us into a question that I was going to ask you related to the uh, climate adaptation finance. And I really like the point that you hit, which is who pays, right? When you think about, you know, the disasters, who finances that? Finances that. Um, but at the same time, and, and I hear you in terms of greater clarity from a policy perspective, in terms of direction uh, of support from um, developed countries. Um, when we think about, uh, obviously, insurance uh, mechanisms, uh, and again, bringing it back to your initial points um, and, and starting to think about financial flows and financing for adaptation. 
when we talk about disasters, climate risk, we're talking about different risks at different levels. And you touched on something that I think was quite salient, which is the right institutional structure, right? Um, what should we be thinking about, or, 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 or when we think about the deployment of insurance solutions? Uh, could be at the sovereign level, you know, the micro level. I would like to get your reflections on that, right? The right institutional structure for insurance solutions when we think about the impact of disasters and really driving change. I think that's a very, very uh, important and, and a difficult question. Partly, um, I think the, the trust in the federal structure in many countries is limited. There, is, there are internal conflicts, and therefore, uh, regions don't necessarily trust the federal government to be you know, fair to them when they have their disaster. If two areas in a country have a disaster, do they have the same claim? And that's, that's, a, that's a very, that complicates this issue considerably because it's not the case that we can think of the nation as a single repository of all insurance uh, need. It's not, you know, so, so you might, uh, in some ideal world, maybe uh, given that insurance is both, uh, it's complicated and people, people need to, will understand it on the ground and then, and then negotiate when the claims are to be made, et cetera. Maybe it's best to have it at a high level, you might imagine. But on the other hand, the problem is having it at a high level. And uh, you know, I think in many countries, this is very salient issue. Uh, there's lots of regional conflicts and uh, you know, interests, different interests. There's little faith in many areas in how the government will uh, you know, treat them in the in the case of a disaster, the federal government. And therefore, uh, there is a real political economy issue which needs to be thought out. And you know, in some ways, uh, there needs to be guarantors who are perhaps outside, uh, the, outside the framework uh, of, the, of the nation. Because I, I, otherwise, I, I worry that this will, this will again generate into, you know, degenerate into the same problem of lack of trust, basically, that I think is plagued the insurance all through, that people don't believe necessarily that ex post their claims will be honored, but then whose who's claims on what, uh, what's, uh, for which disaster, these are all things that need to be. So I think we need a global insurance um, institu institutional framework where uh, there is some outside monitoring which says that yes indeed there is a disaster there's some objectivity to it it's not just a matter of of um, you know uh, claim, claims and counterclaims i think that's a, this is this is a broad and deep problem yes uh, really very important points and i think that we've seen some evolutions um, within the insurance industry i would say when we talk about parametric uh, products which provide perhaps a little bit more clarity in terms of defining uh, disasters. And this obviously can feed into uh, political conversations, which also adds clarity and certainty in terms of what is the insurance coverage, when does it pay or when doesn't it pay, right? Um, so I think that you really hit on some, um, some very important points, also in terms of the different levels, uh, the complexity, the political complexity um, that often exists. So I, I'd like to perhaps steer a little bit um, back to the, the micro level, which is that the main prearranged source of finance that households use uh, to finance response are savings and informal networks, right? Uh, borrowing is used, but rarely prearranged contingent um, credit. How can we begin to expand the toolkit available to low-income countries and communities with a focus on welfare impacts? And particularly, as you mentioned, when we think about insurance, the need for greater education, awareness, this issue of trust that continues to plague us. So I think that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, I think that, uh, as you say, the part of the reason why uh, people don't use it is is uh, using a contingent various kinds of contingent claims is just that the contingency is they don't necessarily believe that the contingency will be honored and part of that is that you write that parametric insurance is a move in the absolutely the right direction nonetheless you know when i say that my uh, the rain gauge 20 kilometers away doesn't it show that you had a drought to a villager who doesn't know how a rain gauge operates. Uh, that's, that's not a, 
an obvious statement anymore. You know, I, I think you and I both have seen, kind of understand what rain gauge is, but I think for many people, that's not an obvious statement. So they, they feel, okay, what, 20 kilometers? It was, didn't rain here. Now, it's true that uh, it didn't rain here, but there being, being my, there being lots of microclimates and there being a threshold for using it, you know, 20 kilometers away, it was two millimeters higher. And that takes us into the range where the insurance claim cannot be so those kinds of claims, it's not just a matter of measurement, it's a matter of making the measurement transparent and making it clear to everybody that we are, um, it's easy to measure, that is, the measurement is credible, that you know, we have to make some choices. So if it's, you know, there has to be some gauge which is not at, at the, you know, the square kilometer level, but maybe at the, you know, 50 square kilometer level or something, all of those things are, you know, people don't understand exactly what that structure is. So even parametric insurance on rain, people are suspicious or deeply suspicious of it for the right reason, which is that they don't understand how it's supposed to be implemented. <coughs> Who measures the rain? Is it, is it my is it someone I trust? Is it someone I don't trust? Is it someone who can be bribed? Uh, you know, all of these issues are deeply embedded in this question. It's not a. It's not something that we have, uh, I think, tackled as as uh, thoroughly as we need to. Yes, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, we could spend an hour talking specifically about that uh, that question. No, 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 um, you're right. Yes, so I will. Uh, so, so really great insights, I think, fantastic in terms of insurance, the challenges that we face, and the complexity of implementation and driving uh, meaningful solutions. But I now want to pivot to to in a different direction, which is um, lessons from evidence. Right? Um, you've you've cited, I think, quite extensively. Uh, your body of work is really built on the importance of evidence in shaping policy. Are there key lessons? that you can share, drawing on the work of J-PAL, um, which you consider as, which we need to consider as we seek uh, to deepen the analytical and evidence building work within this space around the value of insurance, uh, especially as you mentioned, with a focus on low-income vulnerable uh, communities that really have challenges in terms of uh, trust and, and understanding, and also at the sovereign level, frankly, um, around insurance. So I, I think that some of the insights from JPAL's work, from my own work, I already shared, which is uh, frustration with uh, trying to get people to take up very, very simple insurance products. That they, you know, we, we have a bunch of experiments I've been involved in, actually, several of them, where we basically failed to get people to take insurance products, partly uh, for the reason that, you know, some cases, maybe we don't understand with health insurance, there is always the concern that people actually understand it. They just understand that, you know, in an emergency, I can always get to a, go to a hospital and nobody's going to deny me care. So there is there is some some concerns of that class, but, he, but I don't think that covers the whole, uh, you know, uh, from our work, I think the suspicion you know, people saying, "Look, you know, I heard that X was sick and and died, and even and even then she didn't. Her husband didn't get any money for 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 it. And you know, there, there might be truth on either side. It's a very it's a very murky space. So, and that's sort of a, one of I think the key piece of evidence that I would say from our work is how many of our insurance projects we've done with with very moderate success." Um, we have a sister organization called PAD, which works on insurance uh, products, um, mostly to do with agriculture. Um, we, we've been working on it for a while. There are some successes, but overall, I would say uh, limited. And I think uh, that points to partly, uh, I think there is some understanding, and I think a lot of these issues that we've been discussing about how to build trust, how to build clarity, uh, I think more investment in those, most for more funding for you know, pilots which will identify how to do it better will be critical. And I, I think that's going to be true of, of with climate, with, with, with health, with, with um, things like um, you know, pandemics. I think all of these things, because they were very at a local level and because there is uh, lots of 
you, you need people to understand that when they don't get paid, it's not they're not being cheated. I think that's the key issue, is that people often feel that, okay, I gave them the money and then there was some bad, some bad thing happened and I didn't get paid. And the, uh, that's, that level of understanding undermines insurance. We need to get to the point where the education is <coughs> carried out at a level that works. There are pilots, uh, there are evaluations of education efforts. Uh, we do randomized controlled trials, large-scale ones, and including ones where there's an attempt to explain the product, but we haven't got as far as we need to get there on that. And yes. I think the, it's, the, the stake is big for us to work together with the insurance industry to do many more uh, randomized controlled trials. Yes. So thank you, Dr. Banerjee. I will take you up on that offer in terms of the insurance industry working with you and economists generally on this topic. Uh, but again, what, I, what resonated with me is the need for greater investments in evidence, uh, but also greater investments in education and awareness. And it's just a, a, a big gap. But I was also reflecting uh, to, the, to the, the start of our conversation around ex-ante financing, right, and the gap that exists, the question around systems and finance, right, um, and how do we begin to plug that. So I almost feel like even at the sovereign level, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done around insurance and its value. Uh, one of the startling things that I, I that we we deal with in, this, in the space that I'm in is the fact that in many developing countries we are talking about two to three percent insurance penetration rates, which compares to thirty to forty percent and upwards in most developed uh, economies. So it's it's quite shocking <laughs> in many ways, right? And so this presents in a way a huge challenge, but also an opportunity because in many developed countries there are functioning insurance markets that help to take some of that shock, right? So we need to have that concerted effort, yes, in investments in evidence, yes, in investments in greater awareness raising. But with COVID-19, with climate change, for me, this is also quite an untenable situation. Um, but um, great, again, to have your, your reflections on that. So in, in, in the context of evidence um, and acting upon evidence, what do you think are some of the biggest barriers in terms of actually using evidence to inform policy. Again, we see a situation where we know it can be better. We need to do better on ex ante financing side of things, but we see no action, right? How can we better use evidence to drive policy change? I'd, be ple I'd really uh, welcome your, your reflections on that. So I, I would say that the evidence, uh, at some level, I think, People are, um, I think the evidence is, it is being used. I think we, in this conversation, I think there is more awareness of the, these issues we were discussing now than there was 15 years ago. So I think the evidence filters in. I think it's more that where, I would say where the, I think it's still a little abstract, this concept of insurance, and when we talk about ex ante financing for to the government versus ex ante financing to the to an individual in a village in Nigeria. Those are not the same things. And I think this abstraction doesn't help us. I think it's, it's best to think of these as being very different efforts and different. they meet different constraints. And I think I think part of the, I would say, both I think the generation of the evidence, but also having a clearer conceptual framework where let's think of with the federal government, uh, some of the political economy issues that we discussed are critical. With, with the individual consumer in a village, many of the information issues and credibility issues are critical. I think, I think framing what the issue is and working carefully to see, you know, creating alternative approaches and trying to see if which of them works better. I think that's that's the work that for, uh, I think is, it's going on, but it needs to go on in a scale that we haven't uh, yet got to. I think that's, uh, I would say that's, I don't think it's a zero one thing and that, you know, we're just getting everything wrong. But I, I do think that the scale is still uh, relatively limited because we, I, I think there are so many different problems that need to be addressed with each insurance product, a different problem also. You know, some products are easier to explain than others. Some of products have, uh, you, you know, substitutes. Uh, sometimes credit is actually, you know, local credit is pretty efficient. Uh, there's work that's been showing that in villages in Nigeria, people, people actually get to have contingent financing from their friends. Uh, the problem is that, you know, uh, that financing only works when the whole village is not being hit by 
COVID-19 or something. And so there, there's, there is, a, there is a, but the presence of that means that when we design a product, we should be mindful of it. And I think we have those kinds of, you know, very granular uh, knowledge is what I think uh, sometimes critically missing. Yes, excellent. I completely agree with you. Um, I think that we are seeing a shift within the space, Professor Banerjee. I think, you know, for example, the Ensure Resilience uh, Global Partnership bringing together uh, not only donor governments and governments directly, civil society, academics around this issue is hopefully going to allow us to accelerate uh, this conversation. And similarly with the institution um, that, I, that I lead. So I'm really heartened by your comments about the need to broaden this conversation. And that takes me actually... Uh, to uh, a final area, which uh, was, I, I, I made a, a cheeky, I, I would like to make a cheeky statement, uh, again, building on some of your reflections around uh, economists and insurers might actually have a lot in common. And when we think about risk management, uh, I remember your reflection that uh, economists don't perform well on the public popularity test. <laughs> um, insurers might be kind of there with you. Um, so there's a lot that we need to do as a community around this topic in terms of, you know, just building um, awareness. So when you think about the space around po poverty reduction, are there areas uh, that you think that, you know, the insurers and the risk management expertise that exists within the industry could really be helpful as we think through really trying to address uh, issues around poverty allevi alleviation and given what we are seeing with climate change? Uh, again, your, your thoughts on that, I would be very keen, even though you've already welcomed the idea of further collaboration. Yeah, so I, I, I uh, actually so will need to go soon, so let me um, yeah. answer this one quickly. Um, it's, uh, it seems to me that the conversation that we just had is, is, is really the right starting point, which is to establish that at some level, the, the, the problem, we have a shared problem, which is uh, that I think in terms of the the abstraction, I think you understand the abstraction very well, but we also understand the abstraction of insurance very well. It's not that's not where the problem is. The problem is in tailoring that abstraction to the particular context uh, where you know there are suspicions, there's history, there is you know there was this other insurance product that was offered, and that one really the, you know the, the company really misbehaved, and there are many instances of that as a you know and that those create extremely bad blood. Uh, and you have, need to be overcome. I, I've had many conversations where people were telling me, I bought insurance and then they never paid. And God knows who, who was at fault there, but it, it doesn't matter. At some level, it's... it's so I, I think understanding how the... Uh, the to manage those conversations, to go in there and say, this is somehow new, this is somehow credible, this is somehow uh, going to work for you. And this is true at the... At many levels, I think if I take to talk to local governments, local governments don't are among the people who never almost participate in insur in insurance. Actually, you know, so it's it's not, and that's again the same thing. It's often a suspicion and a political suspicion. Suppose I spend my money now and then uh, it doesn't pay off, I'll be blamed as being an idiot. Uh, so you know, I I think all of those kinds of understanding needs to be built at multiple levels. Uh, before, before I think we can have the kind of scope that insurance, in principle, offers. Okay, great. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. I'm very conscious of your of your time and the fact that we did have a, a late start. But I'd like to close this session with actually just reading the last two paragraphs of your book, which I have a copy of, Economics <laughs> for Hard Times, um, and, and it reads as follows. Uh, the only recourse we have against bad ideas is to be vigilant, resist the seduction of the obvious, be skeptical of promised miracles, question the evidence, be patient with complexity, and be honest about what we know and what we can know. Without that vi vi vigilance, conversations about multifaceted problems turn into slogans and caricatures, and policy analysis gets replaced by quack remedies. The call to action is not just for academic economists. It's for all of us who want a better, saner, more humane world. Economics is too important to be left to economists. So thank you again, Professor Banerjee, for your time, leadership, dedication as witnessed through your body of work and many that you have inspired to get involved um, and to ask the right questions so that we can do better. 
Um, we within the insurance community, the Insure Resilience Global Partnership, which is quite diverse, we are prepared to take on this agenda, given the importance right now when we think about climate change, the impact of low and vulnerable communities. And so I will follow up with you on how we can deepen this conversation. So finally, thank you to all of you who have dialed in to join us for this conversation. I hope that you have been inspired, you have learned something new, um, and that you will get involved. And again, thanks to those behind the scenes who have made this possible, um, and in particular to Mary, Marilyn, Alex, uh, Dr. Astrid Zwick, as well as Dr. Alette Detkin. Thank you, Professor Banerjee, and well, thank all you. the very Thank best you for, your, your con con for the conversation. It was very fun. Thank you. Great. Take care. What a treat. Ekos Wahi there in conversation with Professor Banerjee. And I would like to share so many comments and ideas with you, but I won't because we have another session coming up for you.